And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Friends, I don't want to blow my own trumpet here this morning, but I've never murdered anyone. (laughs) Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those in ancient times, in that little group of instructions known as the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. No murders whatsoever, right here. Just acing that one. Now, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, I mean, I am blowing my own trumpet, but I'm not blowing my own trumpet because my current perception is that this is probably also the case for all of us here and for the vast majority of the people in the world as well. Murder happens, of course, and I don't want to make light of the tragedy of it nor of the necessity to avoid it, but it doesn't happen much. And for most of us, this demand is frankly just too easy. So, come on, Jesus, this old commandment is a cinch. Lift the bar a bit. Give us a a challenge. Yeah, we're up for it. We could be moral Olympians here. Give us a challenge. And so Jesus says, well, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, but I say to you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to trial. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Whoa, Jesus. Whoa. I think I'll just stick with the Ten Commandments after all. Thank you very much. Is Jesus talking to us? Is he talking to us with this exaggerated black and white judgmentalism? What do you reckon? Anger is the same as murder. Lustful feelings are as bad as actual infidelity. Divorce is adultery. Swearing an oath in the name of God is the work of the devil. That's an interesting one to start with. Check this out. Here is uh, Richard Nixon swearing his oath of office at the height of the Vietnam War with his hand on two Bibles. Count them. One, two. Both open to Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Ironic. Pretty good effort there, actually. Simultaneously breaking the Ten Commandments, don't swear falsely, and the Sermon on the Mount, don't swear at all. I tried to do the right thing with this one myself recently when I had to appear appear in court for the first time in my life. I was asked to state that in my evidence there I would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I was offered up the Bible upon which to swear an oath by Almighty God to that effect with the Sermon on the Mount ringing in my ears, do not swear an oath at all, especially not by God, I opted to make the alternative affirmation. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I'd just like to say, thanks a lot, Jesus. Thanks a lot. Because what would otherwise have been a fairly straightforward exchange of yeses and noes between me and the magistrate became a complicated and suspicious discussion about why I, a minister of the Christian religion, would refuse to swear on the Bible when every other avowedly Christian person who had ever appeared before her had no qualms about it. I came off sounding like some kind of fundamentalist nut job who thinks that every other person who has ever sworn on the Bible is ignorant and irreligious. Now, to be fair to Mr Abbott and every other Christian Prime Minister and President and Monarch before him, surely he couldn't not swear on the Bible. I mean, talk about losing control of the news cycle, it'd be chaos. Christians would be saying, you've betrayed us, and once he'd explained himself, the secularists would be saying, see, I knew he couldn't keep his faith out of politics. It's a lose-lose for Tony there, so of course he swears on the Bible. Yes, Jesus says unequivocally that swearing on the Bible is the work of the devil, 
but somehow it has become a required cultural practice of Christians. And as my little example shows, doing what Jesus actually teaches may well bring us into conflict with society's norms and expectations. So Ian, I hear you asking, have you applied this to divorce? Good question. There was a time when society's expectations were aligned with the Sermon on the Mount on divorce. But society's expectations have shifted away from that apparent hard line and Christians like me who have observed the great suffering caused by the church's traditional teaching on divorce have shifted with them. Hypocritical? You know, you follow the letter of the law when it comes to swearing oaths on the Bible, Ian, because that's easy, if occasionally inconvenient. But you allow for divorce because humans are frail, human relationships are hard and we sometimes fail. A bit selective about the letter of the law there, Ian. Yes, I am. But is the Sermon on the Mount really about the letter of the law? Christians have always struggled with Christ's teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount because to follow it to the letter is impossible even if we wanted to. Jesus sums it all up in uh, chapter 5 verse 48. He says, follow all these commands. He said, you know, or, or in other words, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Really? Be perfect like God. Surely that's impossible. Sure is, says the great 16th century reformer and anti-Semite Martin Luther. He reckoned that the impossibility of the Sermon on the Mount was designed to show up our inadequacy and hopelessness, to reveal our sinfulness and thereby encourage us to turn to God's grace. Thomas Aquinas in the medieval period thought that the sermon gave counsels of perfection for the select few, for those with a special vocation to the monastic life. The Sermon on the Mount was just for them, which lets the rest of us off the hook nicely. Another good avoidance technique was championed by Nobel Peace Prize winning missionary Albert Schweitzer in the early 20th century. In his quest for the historical Jesus, he taught that the Sermon on the Mount was designed to apply to the time between Christ's first and second coming, which back then was held to be imminent. Naturally, if Jesus had realised it was going to take over 2,000 years, he would have given us a bit more wriggle room. They all say, they all realise what becomes apparent when you read it. It's impossible. For ordinary folk like us, living the demands of the Sermon on the Mount is impossible. So why are we reading it? Why not just extract the few juicy bits that are generally popular, like do unto others as you would have them do to you, and put the rest in the compost bin of history? Why? Because the Sermon on the Mount is entirely not about the letter of the law. You have heard that it was said, says Jesus, repeatedly in reference to the Ten Commandments and other parts of the Old Testament law in the section that we've read today. You've heard that it was said that I say to you something more. I say that if you are observing the letter of those laws, you are not doing enough. Because it is their spirit that matters, not their letters. So yes, in principle, the Ten Commandments are 100% achievable. But is avoiding murder the point, to take my opening example? If you don't murder someone but are abusive towards them, have you fulfilled the spirit of that commandment? No, says Jesus. It is the spirit of the law that matters to God. And the spirit of the law is not just what our society might expect or allow of us, 
No, it's the very character of God. The spirit of the kingdom of heaven on earth is what underlies those laws and is expressed through them. Jesus is looking back at the Ten Commandments and teaching his disciples not to be satisfied with the letter of the law. I'm wanting to do the same with the Sermon on the Mount. I like the challenge of confronting society's expectations by not swearing oaths by God on the Bible. But how is God's character expressed in that? That's what matters, not just the act itself. How is God's character expressed there? What is the spirit of that law? Jesus says, do not swear oaths at all, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. I love that. Let your yes be yes. The spirit of this law is truth. Simple, unadorned truth. We need to ask this same question of all the other teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. What is the spirit of this law? How is God's character expressed in it? Which is difficult to do in those places where the spirit seems to be repressive or judgmental, such as in those applying to divorce. But our best guide for this is Jesus himself, who disregards the letter of the law when it conflicts with the spirit of love. Healing on the Sabbath, touching the unclean, eating with sinners and tax collectors. The scholar J.P. Meyer describes Jesus' approach to the law in the Sermon on the Mount as a radical interiorisation. A good bit of jargon there, I like that. A radical interiorisation. Just as God promises through the prophet Jeremiah, I will put my law within you and I will write it on your hearts. The spirit of the law, that is, not its letters. Jesus desires that our hearts would strive to give expression to the character of God which underlies the law. God's heart expressed in our living, in our striving, Striving to be loving, not hateful. Truthful, not false. Reconciling, not divisive. Peaceful, not abusive. Faithful, not disloyal. The spirit of these teachings that we've heard today, that's what matters that we would strive to be shaped by them, shaped, in fact, by the character of God, the holiness and perfection of God. So may we approach every relationship in that spirit, every act, every encounter, asking not what does some external law demand, but what is God's heart saying to my heart as we live the coming kingdom into being. Let us pray. Speak to our hearts, Holy One. Make our hearts live with your love, with your truth, with your peace, with your reconciliation. Open to us the teachings of Christ that we may absorb and live out of the spirit of your kingdom amongst us. In Jesus' holy name.